Jewish life in the Dark Ages. We have to understand what do we mean by this term, the Dark Ages. So it is uh, a term that comes largely out of Western European historiography, which for a long time, like let's say 18th century onward, tended to view the flow of Western history as kind of like being a really high point with Greco-Roman civilization, and then with the collapse of Rome, and especially its sacking by the Vandals in the 5th century, it hits a real low where you have kind of Conan the Barbarian Ages, and there's not much happening, and no one's reading, and no one's writing, and people are very superstitious about all kinds of things. And it kind of sits there until it goes back up again with the Renaissance, which literally means the rebirth. Uh, there are definitely some kind of ladder-like steps up from the Dark Ages, the Gothic period and so on. The High Middle Ages, which kind of goes from about 1000 to about the year 1300, when you start seeing the beginnings of the Renaissance and some really exciting things happening that leads ultimately to the early modern era, the modern era and so on. But the, the key element of this is it's very Eurocentric. It's as if the most important thing that's going on in history is whatever's happening in Europe. But in reality, when you look at world history, uh, most of the universe, most of the world was not dark at all. And I think you can say that about the Jews as well, who are at this point not especially wrapped up in most of Northwestern European history in particular. So uh, let's look at what Jews were doing in the Dark Ages. We've seen this map before from the beautiful Barnavi historical atlas. Um, and as you can see, there are two really big centers of Jewish activity during the Dark Ages. Again, we're going to kind of uh, taking the traditional view of the Dark Ages, which goes from the fall of Rome and like, let's say, 405, 476 are major dates, so 5th century dates, all the way up to about 950, uh, 1000. So you got about 500 years that are really dark for Northwestern Europe in particular, not much happening. Um, and uh, it is the collapse of Roman civilization that leads to that, although Roman civilization is largely taken over by Byzantine civilization, the same kind of Christian culture, uh, although many very significant differences, not Catholic, for example, would be become later called Orthodox. The more formal split wouldn't happen until the 11th century, but uh, definitely heading in a different direction. But it's kind of like the second Rome based in Constantinople, which you can see at the top of this map. But I got off on a little bit of a tangent there. What are Jews doing uh, during the Dark Ages? So we've got two really huge areas of Jewish activity, which are quite intense during the Dark Ages. Um, you have that large brown circle, which is the region around Israel, uh, where you've got lots of activity. You've got lots of uh, uh, halakhic activity, uh, intellectual activity, being of the Jerusalem Talmud with the activity of the patriarchs. They're organizing themselves. They are, uh, you know, sort of negotiating their relationship with the Romans, which is not always so easy. And then later with the Byzantine overloads. But there's still quite a bit of historical data emerging from uh, the Middle East uh, during the Dark Ages. And then perhaps more significantly, and I wish the, the, the actual circle was bigger because it would give more of an impact, but Baghdad, oh my gosh, there's so much going on there with the uh, transplanted yeshivot of Pumbedita and Sura, with the great intellectual centers of the Talmud that are just pumping away all kinds of stuff during this period, right up until the 7th century when you get the Muslim advance. And when the Muslims take it over, then they have an even greater explosion uh, under the Geonim, which we spoke about a few lectures ago. In fact, that's where we use this map. And the uh, the the... Uh, Baghdadi culture, the uh, Mesopotamian culture, uh, kind of like radiates all the way out through the Mediterranean basin and has its impact felt all the way out to Cordoba in Spain, where you see there's major Jewish communities. And it is during this period that, you know, it's true we have a lot of the Visigoths and so on, but we also get into the beginnings of the Spanish Golden Age. They have their roots during the period known as the Dark Ages. So these two areas represent 
the uh, the light that was coming out of the Jewish community in particular, uh, and uh, really has a very different kind of picture than what you think of uh, with uh, Northern Europe in the same period of time. But neither of these areas, of course, the Middle East and uh, the, uh, the Mesopotamian region are in Europe. So what is happening in Europe in particular? So the most important areas, to be sure, are in Italy. Uh, there are just not that many Jews living in the rest of Europe. We have tiny, tiny little settlements in the, the Rhone River, for example, uh, infinitesimally small ones in the, the Rhine River region, um, and like just little outposts, as it were. But in Rome in particular, and in uh, the south, in Bari and Oria, you have some phenomenal uh, centers of Jewish population where they are deeply involved in all kinds of uh, Talmudic work and all kinds of historical work, poetic work. We have some beautiful uh, remains of Jewish catacombs in Rome in particular that give us a sense of the extent of their civilization, and, and they're really doing a lot. In many ways, as we saw earlier with the uh, tracing of Ashkenazic culture from Israel proper, through the Italian peninsula and then into Northern Europe, this is the period where there is a lot of culture going on in this area here. I think some of my favorite expressions of Roman Jewish culture, uh, extending towards the end of this period of the Dark Ages, is the remarkable work, the Aruch, uh, which was written by Natan of Rome. And uh, this is essentially the first dictionary of the Talmud ever. And it was a brilliant dictionary because, of course, don't forget, Jews are working in many different vernaculars. They're working in Latin, they're working in Greek, uh, but the texts are in Aramaic and also in Hebrew. And, you know, you need secondary materials to be able to negotiate these texts. So uh, Natan of Rome, who had a family name, Anav, meaning the humble ones, he composed the first uh, dictionary of the Talmud, and it's it's beautiful, it's brilliant, not only because it's, it's not simply a word-for-word -word translation of the, the words that occur in the Talmud, it provides examples of how those words are used in the Talmud, and ends up becoming an, an incredibly important finding aid, such that you know, for a millennia, well, a millennium since it was written towards the uh, end of the first millennium, many Talmudic scholars use the dictionary not so much to understand the translation of a given Aramaic word, but to know where it's used elsewhere in the Talmud, because it is essentially kind of like a, um, what's the word, the concordance as well as a Talmud. It's a great really amazing work. So there's lots of scholars who are here in Rome and in uh, southern Italy. Many of them would later be transplanted to uh, northern Europe, to Ashkenaz, where they would essentially become the the nucleus of the Jewish community there. And we'll speak about them, God willing, a lot more next week. But that's really hardly dark at all for Jews. Jews are doing amazing things in this region in terms of poetry and scholarship and so on. And, uh, you know, the, the whole concept of the Dark Ages doesn't make that much sense when you're thinking about Jewish history. Also, we have, you know, not a tremendous amount of historical data about what Jews were up to in the Dark Ages, uh, especially when you move outside of Muslim-controlled lands into European lands. But one really interesting glimpse is a reference that occurs in Muslim historiography to the so-called Radhanite merchants. Now, it's clear from the context of the discussion of the Radhanites that they are Jewish, and they are clearly roaming the world and involved in multiple areas of trade. The term Radhanite is up to a lot of scholarly discussion. There's a huge debate as to why they are called the Radhanites by the medieval Muslim historian who described their activity. My favorite... Um, understanding of this term is that it comes from the Rhone River, which is in central Paris, central France. You can see here it basically uh, bisects France here, ends up in Marseille. And this Rhone River is a very important uh, waterway that, you know, begins in central uh, France and then, you know, comes out to the Mediterranean. And as you can see from this map here, the dark line indicates the uh, specific routes 
that the uh, Muslim historiography describes as part of the destinations of these Radhanite tra uh, travelers. Uh, and they're selling stuff, by the way. They're buying and selling all over. Uh, and the sort of dotted lines indicate uh, the extended trade routes that we know would meet up with most of those places. So it's not at all out of the question to assume that there were Jews who were traveling literally all over the world, uh, engaged in a whole variety of trade um, as they uh, were, were active throughout the region. And before I leave that map, let me also mention that uh, the... Uh, the, the Jews are, are deeply involved in one of the most important trade routes, which as you can see right in the center there, it goes um, from Antioch uh, through the Euphrates River down to the Persian Gulf. This is one of the most important trade routes for the silk trade. Jews were heavily involved in the early silk trade, which was a major reason for the dispersion of Jewish ideas. Uh, the, the spread of Judaism predated the spread of Christianity and in some ways actually prepared many of these territories for a monotheistic faith because of these Jewish merchants going on. One of the things I happened to read just today, which fascinated me, is that um, the silk trade, uh, especially when Rome was active, the, uh, the Jews of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers were especially involved in reweaving silk, meaning the Chinese, who were the people who were making silk out of the, uh, you know, this, the uh, cocoons of, uh, of uh, uh, certain types of silkworms that grow in mulberry trees, they were, uh, the Chinese liked to make their silk into um, more thick, durable cloth for their clothing. The Romans, on the other hand, said, no, 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 we don't like that. We want it sheer and filmy and, uh, you know, something that you drape over yourself and, and something quite a bit uh, more racy. And so the Jews were actually involved in reweaving, that they often took the silk cloth from China and then they reweaved it. They actually pulled out the thread and then remade it into a much more diaphanous cloth that would be sold at a much higher price in Rome. Just a funny little detail there, I thought. Oh, okay. Anyway, so let, the, the Jews are definitely heavily involved in this international travel. Now, why the Jews? Well, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy or a self-affirming cycle because the Jews do have a common language, uh, Hebrew. They have a common legal system such that, you know, they're all bound by the the rulings of the Talmud and uh, they can rely on a neutral you know, body of judges who will not judge them by the capricious laws of a specific reason. I'm going to get more into that in just a second. Uh, they also have a strong co-religionist bond such that it is not at all uncommon. And in fact, it was widely common right up into the 20th century in Eastern Europe, where a, a stranger could show up in a synagogue on Friday night and say simply, hey, you know, I, I need a place to stay for Shabbat, and they, he'd be taken in for meals, I have a place to sleep, and then once the Shabbat was over, then the, he would say, okay, here I am, I'm selling wine or silk or whatever it is, have you got anyone who wants to trade with me? And of course, the, the business was self-affirming. So the diaspora of the Jews was actually the foundation of the uh, international commerce that they would be engaged in right up until contemporary times. There is a long historical tradition for this. We will explore the economic aspects of this, God willing, in a, in a lecture later this uh, summer or later this spring, I guess. Um, so hang on, there's lots more to say about that. But let's go to uh, the roots of Ashkenaz. So I, I refer to the Jewish legal tradition, which is extremely important when you consider the kind of situation that was going on in real dark ages, Northern Europe. Now I'm talking about the region of what would be today France and Germany and so on. So we're talking a really weird, backward, pre-Christian kind of environment where they, uh, they uh, adjudicate trials, for example, by ordeals. Like this is a, a, a drawing of the so-called ordeal by water in which you had a person suspected of some kind of criminal activity and so the best way to see how well they did is if you tie them up and throw them in the lake and if they don't drown then they're innocent 
because the gods protected them. Or even as it slowly begins to morph into Christianity, God protected them, singular God. So that's definitely not kosher by Talmudic standards. Another version of the ordeal was, you know, two people are... are uh, are in a legal fight and one of them claims he's totally innocent so the judge can say all right we're going to boil up this vat of oil and we're going to drop an iron ring in it and uh, you reach into that boiling vat of oil if you can take the ring out without being harmed that will mean that you are obviously innocent and if you are not willing to do it it must mean that you are guilty like yikes I would not want to be anywhere near this kind of legal system. Give me the Talmud any day, you know, rules of evidence and testimony and things like that, please. So, uh, and one last thing, of course, which uh, I'm not sure how much, how Jews felt about this, but there was the trial by conduct or ordeal by combat, where uh, you could defend your innocence by simply going hand to hand with your uh litigant, and this is probably not historically accurate from the period I'm talking about, but I kind of liked it. Um, and uh, uh, this is also something that uh, has no basis in uh, Talmudic jurisprudence. So luckily, Jews were largely exempt in Ashkenaz from any of these trial by ordeal. Uh, and uh, they were able, even in these kind of really backward, Conan the Barbarian kind of environments, able to uh, have their affairs judicated according to Talmudic law. This was an arrangement that benefited the Jews and also benefited the region because they were the traders. They were the people who brought goods in. And of course, they're in a tiny minority traveling up and down these riverways, you know, with valuable goods. But uh, if if the society cannot support people engaged in this kind of trade, then it'll simply stop and people will not have the goods that they want to buy. So there is kind of an investment in giving the Jews that level of legal autonomy. And we see in the Dark Ages that Jews are granted this in the few number of uh, communities that we see them appearing in Northern Europe. That's quite fascinating. At this point, we begin to see the nucleus of something we will... I'm afraid I have to discuss in much greater detail later, but the nucleus of the formation of the Kahila structure. This is the formal municipal self-government of the Jews that they developed very strongly in Northern Europe, although it definitely has similarities to what was going in Muslim regions as well. The Jews essentially form for themselves a small state within a state, at least at the municipal level. Later on, when we get to about the 16th century, we'll see that it expands really to a, a massive level in Poland and Lithuania, where the municipalities are individually connected with one another. But essentially, the Jews in these tiny little struggling communities, we're talking about less than a thousand people in any of them, uh, are granted the right to govern themselves. They're granted certain protections uh, in order to largely benefit the trade, and later, as we shall see, benefit the tax structure and the tax revenue of the crown. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry to be talking about this now because we're going to spend at least all, you know, one of these videos talking about Jews in the medieval economy, and this is crucial. But what it gives us for now is the possibility of Jewish social independence, that they are, through the Kehillah structure and through their legal autonomy, able to run their own affairs and create their own social safety net uh, with uh, education, with uh, you know, support for the elderly, support for orphans and widows, support for poor brides, uh, all kinds of things to ensure that the Jews are self-sufficient as a community and contribute to their ongoing survival, uh, despite the relative barbarity of the Dark Ages in Europe. So that's just by way of introduction. I want to give you that kind of background coloring as we go on to speak now about the Rishonim, and uh, I think the contrast is going to be absolutely stark.